It's late June, 1789, and Paris teeters on a knife's edge. Driven by hunger and poverty, the people have taken to the streets. Their demands that the National Assembly compel grain merchants to sell their produce at fair prices go unheeded. Their plight is ignored, but their hunger still gnaws. Taking matters into their own hands, Parisians occupy public spaces, blockade government buildings, and march in bands of several thousand. Their demands simple, their aim singular. Get the National Assembly to act. And yet there is still no remedial action. As tensions escalate, jails are stormed, homes are looted, munitions seized, and the authorities cower away, hoping the mob will leave them alone. The formation of the National Assembly, only weeks ago, heralded by many as the dawn of a new age, had done little to address the economic issues that faced France. Though they debated Necker's most recent reform package, their main focus was fixed on political issues, namely the framing of a constitution. But those economic issues aren't lying dormant on the Assembly's account. The French economy is still in dire straits. Inflation is unrestrained, corruption is rampant, inequity is the norm, the cost of living is unbearable, rent and debt repayments are coming due, and it appears to Parisians that those in power are doing nothing. And Paris isn't unique. All across the kingdom, protests flare up and burn out. Many of these uprisings are well organised. The protesters are armed, formed into ad hoc militias, which can only be quashed with brutal reprisal. In response, regional authorities order military crackdowns that rarely ended without bloodshed. The future Emperor Napoleon is involved in one such skirmish at Autun. All this bloodshed and resentment culminated in that most famous event of the revolution, the fall of the Bastille. Even if you know nothing else about the revolution, you've certainly heard of the fall of the Bastille. Tracing back the threads that unraveled into terrible violence on July 14th takes us back to orders issued by Minister for War Deborah Lee in early June, stationing additional troops in the capital. Behind Louis' back, an extra six regiments had been diverted to Paris to garrison various strategic points, the Champ de Mars, the Tuileries, and the Bastille. Louis wasn't terribly engaged in affairs of state at this time, Only days removed from the death of his son, the king wasted away, ruminating on his humiliating defeat at the hands of the National Assembly. The legacy he had inherited from his father, grandfather, and great-grandfather lay tattered and in ruins. With every passing minute, the last vestiges of Bourbon absolutism were being overwritten by a constitution that would officially demote him to a mere head of state and legitimise non-royal civic authority. We know Louis pretty well by now, not lacking for intelligence, but indecisive and at critical moments, weak-willed. Trying to be everyone's friend, his positions could change on a dime, with whoever he spoke to last. As the nucleus of government and royal authority, Louis was ill-suited to navigating the treacherous tides of monumental political and social change. In the main, he was content to be swept away with the current. In light of the king's disengagement, Broly took charge, aiming to stabilise Paris, hence his orders for reinforcements. It's very clear that the troops he commanded were there to preserve the peace. After all, Paris was experiencing some nasty riots. Yet this did nothing to quash rumours that an ulterior motive was at play. An army kept close for a potential reactionary counter-coup. In truth, nothing of the sort was even planned, much less considered. Both Louis and Broly remained cautious, fearing what might happen if they provoked the mob by forcefully suppressing the National Assembly. But regardless of their intentions, the king and his ministers inadvertently did provoke outrage. Greatly alarmed at the troop build-up, individual Assembly delegates financed a propaganda blitz aimed at stoking resentment. Pamphleteers in particular heightened fears that the army intended to forcefully dissolve the National Assembly and reinstitute the tyranny of the nobility. Given the choice between siding with the Assembly 
or the Ancien Regime, the Parisians eagerly flocked to the defence of the National Assembly. Quickly, royal troops found themselves outnumbered and, incredibly enough, outgunned by mobs that swelled to many tens of thousands. The more troops made their presence known with arrests and crackdowns, the more incensed the mob became and the more vicious their attacks. On Louis' order, ten more regiments were sent to Paris as reinforcements, raising the number of troops from around 4,000 to 20,000. But morale was low, and the will to fight for the king was almost non-existent among the rank and file. In one notable instance, ten local guardsmen refused their orders to disperse a mob, and then publicly decried their officers. Now they were promptly arrested, but pretty soon were liberated by the mob, which forced its way into the prison where the guardsmen were being held. Soon thereafter, the National Assembly organised for the guardsmen to be reinterred, but only for a single night, and then released in the morning, no charges laid. Because of the unreliability of local Parisian guard units, the monarchy relied increasingly upon German and Swiss foreign mercenaries, loyal to coin and not principle. They occupied several avenues and bridges in and around Paris, essentially putting the city on lockdown. They even went so far as to deploy artillery, cannons and howitzers. It was clear for all to see that the gloves were coming off. Mirabeau employed his considerable oratory skill in a proclamation on the 8th of July in which he boldly decried the king's actions. A few days later, on the 10th, the National Assembly issued an official complaint to the king, but were assured that the military presence was vital for public safety. Such a vague response failed to alleviate anybody's fears. By now, Necker's 35-point economic reform package had been registered by the National Assembly. Not because it was well-liked, but because, well, it was the best of limited options. But with this final, albeit belated success, Necker's time at the reins was ended. Louis reorganised the royal ministries, purging those of questionable loyalty or dubious connections to the National Assembly. Necker had only ever evaded such purges by being essential to the success of economic reforms, and also because of his popularity with the people. Now, with his political purpose served, Necker's popularity alone was not enough to save him. Louis had wanted the Director General ousted for a while now. Ever since the controversial Comte Rendu, the king had despised Necker, and so needed little persuasion to remove him from office. At supper time on the 11th of July, Necker received a letter from the royal ministry. They no longer had any need of his services. Calmly tucking the letter away, Necker finished his meal and immediately afterwards packed his things and fled the country for the second time. From now on, only outspoken royalists were permitted to hold high office. It was for this reason that the taciturn Baron de Brutaille became Controller General of Finance quite literally immediately after Necker was ousted. The loss of the architect of economic reforms, and such an extremely popular French political figure, had obvious economic ramifications. A slump in the market value of the livre, and a stock market crash as residual faith in the French economy collapsed. Many of the middle class who had avoided the worst of recent famine and inflation overnight found themselves bankrupt and insolvent. Bankers, lawyers, craftsmen, artisans, civil servants, administrators, all now found their fates tied to that of the common French peasant. From now on, they would be more keenly subject to the rising price of bread and deplorable economic conditions. But that's to say nothing of how the common people reacted to Necker's unceremonious dismissal. Already pissed with the troop build-up, this was the final straw. If the deployment of troops to Paris was adding fuel to the fire, then the king's most recent miscalculation was chucking on gasoline. Since his first tenure in power, Necker had enjoyed the esteem of the common Frenchman. This was in part to Necker's humble origins, but mostly down to his support for massively subsidised bread. With him out of the picture, it certainly seemed 
that empty bellies would rumble on unfilled. When word of Nikkei's dismissal reached the streets on the morning of the 12th of July, truly cataclysmic rioting began anew. Fear and frenzy gripped the mobs. When word was spread that this might also be the prelude to the rumoured reactionary counter-coup. If this was the case, it meant the death of the National Assembly and the revocation of any of the gains thus far made. Where before only isolated bands of troops might be struck by rioters, now entire army camps were directly attacked. The Royal Alamond Regiment, for instance, was brazenly bombarded with stones and bricks in the Tuileries Gardens. Demoralised troops deserted the army or even joined the budding revolution. Troops of the Jeanne Francais, now of proven unreliability, defected en masse and volunteered to aid the rioters. Their loyalty was no longer to the king, they declared, but to the people and the nation. The few shops that were not boarded up, or whose owners were not joining in the frenzy, were targeted and ransacked. Businesses had the contents of their warehouses seized and well-off townsmen had their homes trashed. Famously, a wax model of Nicaea was stolen and carried through the streets in solidarity with the popular former minister, now exile. The crowds also demolished the custom houses and barriers in and around the city, which until now had extorted tariffs from merchants entering and leaving the city. This meant that the price of bread could come down slightly. By decree of the National Assembly, many of the plazas, gardens and open areas of Paris were made public, where before they had only been open to the wealthy or the elite. By day these areas were a bustling hub of open-air revolutionary discussion. Public decrees and announcements were made in these places, and then spread through word of mouth, but also through the efforts of the indispensable pamphleteers. It was around now, as the nascent revolutionary movement had coalesced and was becoming unified in its goals and aims, that a common consciousness was born in the minds of young political radicals who did more to stir up the proverbial shit than anyone else. In the green space outside the Palais Royal, some inspired demagoguery from a young radical journalist saw the first of many physical symbols of the revolution become popular and widespread. Reportedly, after a brave declaration never to be taken alive by the soldiers that were now surrounding the mob, Camille Desmoulins drew two pistols and rushed to the adoring arms of the crowd, proclaiming that he would rather die than live in servitude. Desmoulins then urged the people to wear a green cockade in their hats. Some pinched some leaves from surrounding trees. Others adorned themselves with green fabric. This newly formed Verdant mob began by parading through the halls and theatres of the western ends of Paris. This all caused quite a ruckus and disrupted the early evening meals of the well-to-do. Furniture was upended, shops were looted, windows broken, and plenty of people got into plenty of mischief. Other Parisians joined the marauding mob, and it grew and grew and grew to a swollen sum of several thousand. Eventually, the mob descended upon the Tuileries. German mercenary dragoon units tried in vain to contain the mob, beating them back with the flats of their sabres. But they could do little to stem the tide. Luckily for them, some guard units arrived on scene, but then they immediately joined the mob, and then fired on the dragoons. They fled for their lives, yielding the Tuileries to the mob. Things only calmed down when some assembly associates came to placate the mobs that Desmoulins and other ringleaders dispersed the crowds. Alarmed at the chaos and the near-total collapse of municipal authority across Paris, the National Assembly felt it was high time to address the pleas of the Parisians in finding a solution to the grain crisis. Debate on how best to alleviate these pains had raged from the 4th to the 7th of July, but failed to make any headway, and shortages continued. All subsequent efforts had fared no better. As a result of this latest failure, many members of the National Assembly sought other means of exerting some measure of control upon the rampaging rioters. With the tacit approval of the Assembly, the Electoral College for Paris had continued to meet even after their official duties had ended. The college was well populated, 
consisting of head electors for the Paris Parlement and hundreds of disgruntled, disenfranchised, and dispirited bourgeoisie. Their prospects had been affected by recent reversals, like the stock market crash and the damage inflicted on Paris. Dubbed the Permanent Committee, the Assembly permitted them to occupy the Hôtel de Ville. They existed as a sort of parallel authority to the municipal authorities. But being as they were drawn from a far more revolutionary set, they had a much better handle on the situation than official authorities. In fact, it was members of the permanent committee who had talked down the rioters in the Tuileries on July 12th. As a part of their self-appointed duties, they established a militia, the brainchild of Lafayette. Each soldier was decked out in the tricolours, red, white and blue. Now ostensibly, the militia existed to protect the public and maintain order. But it's pretty obvious that it was mostly there to protect the property and businesses of the committee members. Nonetheless, in spite of its bourgeois credentials, this militia, named the National Guard, proved very popular with the people. The committee attempted to direct the passions of the mob away from the banks and businesses of the middle class. But even they could do little to stem the tide when the crowds really got going on the 12th and 13th. Actually, on the 13th, a massive crowd gathered in the Abbe de Saint-Lazare but only after having looted every single blacksmith and gun store in Paris for weapons and ammunition. There they found stockpiled grain, lending credence to claims that the grain was being hoarded by the elite. When troops arrived to drive away the mob, the response was to pillage and burn the abbey, at which point the troops tucked tail and fled. By the morning of the 14th, the situation in Paris had reached critical mass. The energy of the mob was reaching a fever pitch, and the crowds were whipped into a frenzy by rumours that the order had been given for the royal army to pacify the city. It was said that the soldiers were already on the march. These rumours were just that, rumours, but were sufficiently alarming to compel the permanent committee to direct the National Guard and defector army units to occupy strategic locations. Ammunition, food and goods were shall we say procured, and then stockpiled outside the Hôtel de Ville. By now, the mob had assembled outside too, and were demanding that weapons and ammunition be distributed immediately. Obviously, the committee didn't want to go out giving guns to everybody, and what few they did have had been given out the night before. But a rumour had spread that the Hôtel de Ville was home to a massive stockpile of guns and bullets. So one of the deputies for the committee pontificated in a speech to the crowd and tried, largely in vain, to allay their suspicions and fears. He held the line for a few hours until the mob became restless. Bang for blood, some portion of the mob broke away and descended upon Les Invalides. Now there actually were guns and bullets at Les Invalides. Housed inside were 32,000 muskets and a couple of pieces of cannon. Not to mention enough bullets, gunpowder, and cannonballs for all of them. The masses seethed as their demands for these weapons were denied. The governor inside declaring himself unable to distribute arms without orders from the king. Sensing that the situation was deteriorating, he ordered the soldiers of Les Invalides, mostly old men and wounded from the infirmary, to spike the guns. But the soldiers deliberately disobeyed. Commanders for the garrison at the nearby Champ de Mars reported that their men too were openly seditious. A final abortive attempt to avoid the seemingly inevitable confrontation was made when a deputy from the permanent committee pushed his way through the front gates and met with the governor. But when the gate to the Envelide was opened slightly too far, the crowd was contained no longer. They pressed through en masse and stormed into the subterranean armories where the Envalide guards stood aside. Thousands of Parisians were now equipped with muskets. They'd even managed to pinch ten pieces of cannon. Armed, dangerous and angry, the mob was lacking only for a decent target upon which to vent their fury. But not for long. As storm clouds, both real and rhetorical, brewed above the Paris sky, the revolution descended upon the city's most imposing and formidable fortress, the Bastille. 
it was, for many Parisians, the physical manifestation of the Ancien Regime. Cold, distant, imperious, daunting. Many popular liberals, like Mirabeau, who had been arrested under the Lettre de Cachet, had spent time in the Bastille. Rumour swirled that the guards conducted torture deep within its dark recesses. More recently, the Marquis de Sade had escaped captivity and proclaimed naked from atop the walls that a massacre of bound prisoners had occurred. Beyond mere symbolism, an attack upon the Bastille carried a practical purpose. Inside those walls was a stockpile of desperately needed gunpowder. What better target, then, for the mob's wrath? Well, there were certainly softer targets than the imposing medieval fortress. Originating from the Hundred Years' War, it had been built in the mid-13th century, at a strategic location on the Seine. A position from where all of its huge five- to seven-storey tall stone walls and towers overlooked the eastern approaches to the city. Though its long and storied history saw the Bastille used to suppress or destroy many a Parisian revolt, it was largely converted in the 17th century into a prison for delinquents, drunkards, and political prisoners. The salacious rumours of torture and squalor for which the Bastille was infamous were really quite unfounded, as it was a pretty good prison by the standards of the day. It only earned its grim reputation when a few former inmates, like the aforementioned Marquis de Sade, began to publish their falsified memoirs of torture and deprivation. The Bastille had not forgotten her original function, however. Cannon brimmed from its sheer stone walls. Nowadays, those cannons overlooked the rowdy, revolutionary neighbourhoods of the Faubourg Saint-Antoine. And it was from their vantage point high above the Faubourg that garrisoned Swiss guardsmen surveyed the mob as it flooded into the streets and plazas along the Rue Saint-Antoine, Rue de Tournelle, and the Rue de jean Bossier. Even holed up inside such a stout redoubt, the soldiers grew increasingly fearful at the sheer weight of numbers the mob had brought to bear. On the other hand, the Marquis de Launay, the governor of the Bastille, was quietly confident that the fortress was unassailable. Under his orders, arms and munitions had been transferred from the royal arsenal and stockpiled. After strengthening the moat, he had positioned cannons on the battlements, and several other pieces were aimed at the entryway courtyard, where overlapping arcs of fire had created a killing field. The various openings in the embrasures had been widened to allow for greater volumes of fire to be poured down upon potential attackers. The two adjacent drawbridges, one small and one larger one, were drawn up and closed tight with thick iron chains. All in all, he was right to feel secure behind the Bastille's thick walls. Feeling so secure, Launay refrained from much direct input to the officers on watch. His aloofness alarmed these officers, who viewed with growing alarm the influx of thousands upon thousands of armed rioters. Launay was known as an amicable but meek fellow, and it was his indecision in the coming hours that would prove fateful. So when his officers were to report that the garrison troops were refusing to fight, If the rioters stormed the fortress, Launay dismissed these concerns out of hand. With the situation of the Bastille heating up, a small delegation from the Permanent Committee was formed, their intention being to forestall the confrontation by meeting with Launay and negotiating some concessions. It was around mid-morning, by the time the delegation had wormed their way through the masses and announced their presence to the guards. They were admitted inside, and met Lornay at breakfast. Noise emanating from the crowd was immense, made even louder when they stormed the barracks, houses and cafes along the route to the Bastille. The Marquis offered no resistance to demands that cannons be removed, or that the troops board up the embrasures. But here's where it starts to go wrong. From the perspective of the crowd, the delegation had disappeared inside the Bastille some time ago, and no word had been heard from them since. And now, the cannons were all being removed, one by one. Many concluded that the cannons were being loaded, and that the delegation must have been arrested. Calls to act became louder and clearer. But violence was postponed for a time, when a second delegation was formed, and sent to ascertain the location of the first delegation. Funnily enough, they met each other on the way out. In spite of this, the second delegation met Lonnais with new demands. The Bastille was to be surrendered to the National Guard, and the stockpiled powder was to be handed out to the mob. 
Naturally, Lornay refused the offer, stating that no such action was possible without written permission from Versailles. He was, however, keen to demonstrate his goodwill. Lornay toured the battlements with an acquaintance he knew from among the delegation. Atop the walls, he showed that the cannons were both unloaded and out of position. Moreover, his troops would only fire if fired upon. But the demands were nonetheless reiterated to the governor. The Marquis de Lonnais would likely have accepted these demands outright if it had not been for his Swiss officers, who, though sympathetic to the revolutionaries, could not entertain the notion of surrender as it would besmirch their honour. It is possible that the bloodshed of July 14th could have been avoided if a few officers were not so intractably honour-bound. Nevertheless, the delegation exited the Bastille empty-handed. It was now that the crowd would play its infamous part in the day's events. Soldiers barked warnings from the walls which went unheard or ignored, as more and more people massed outside the walls. The next few minutes proved critical. With one drop, the bucket had runneth over. Or perhaps more accurately, two drops. A pair of protesters climbed some portion of the battlements and snuck into the fortress. When inside, they found the drawbridge levers and broke the mechanism with pickaxes before fleeing. The smaller, secondary oak drawbridge, now unhinged, fell open with a resounding thud. One poor fellow was actually crushed when it fell. Like a dam that had been broken, the massed mob flooded into the now open courtyard of the inner Bastille. It's not known who fired the first shot. Was it furious revolutionaries denied the ability to open the main drawbridge, as was later claimed by Swiss officers? Or was it the defending garrison who, their warnings ignored, felt their safety threatened and so chose to open fire? What is known is that soon after breaching the inner courtyard, the din of the crowds was overridden by the staccato crack of musket fire and the boom of cannon. The besieged and the besiegers were now in open conflict. The storming of the Bastille had begun. Most of the first wave of attackers was pinned down in the narrow courtyard of the Corps de Gouvernement. They took what little cover there was, but sustained murderous fire from the defenders. Any attempt to break out by passing through the nearby kitchen, storming the drawbridge, or taking the governor's quarters, was thwarted by the far more disciplined garrison. But with every minute, more and more musket-armed attackers were swarming into the Bastille. In order to get more people into the fight, the mob performed a feat of tactical ingenuity you would think beyond them. The garrison knew to fire on the drawbridge as reinforcements streamed in. So the attackers stole two large carts, filled them with hay and set them alight, forming a thick, billowing smoke screen. In spite of their incredible perseverance and courage, the first few waves were beaten back, with several dead and wounded among them. The thick clouds of smoke and the echo of gunfire had attracted the attention of the National Assembly. They sent a third delegation from the Permanent Committee to organise a ceasefire. This delegation arrived by early afternoon and made an abortive attempt to contact the garrison. Reportedly, they waved white handkerchiefs above their heads and were, for some reason, surprised when they failed to gain anyone's attention. After some time, however, they were spotted and then let in. There they offered Lornay a ceasefire and to have the National Guard occupy the Bastille. But again, Lornay was pressured by his officers to reject the demands. Negotiations failed. The delegation was ejected. The mob, seeing the delegation kicked out so soon, became convinced that the peace had been rejected in bad faith. Their suspicions were only confirmed when unmotivated fire resumed from the ramparts. The revolutionary assault resumed with renewed vigour and ferocity. Even as casualties rose, the attack was pressed, and with each hour they gained more and more ground. Now, all the way back at the Hôtel de Ville, the third delegation had returned to deliver news of their failure. While preparations were being made for a fourth delegation, the mob, essentially contiguous all the way from the hotel to the Bastille, made fresh demands for guns and powder. But these demands were denied. Another small-scale Bastille was only narrowly avoided at the hotel by the timely intervention of a few popular liberal politicians. By late afternoon, the fourth delegation arrived at the Bastille, but this time 
they were led by an army flag bearer and a drummer. In an incredible display of courage, the delegates braved the bodies, bullets and fire to deliver their demands. The beleaguered defenders huddled behind their walls and exhausted from a day of hard fighting were eager to surrender. Lornay and his officers, however, refused to accept the delegation. Somewhere between when the first shots were fired and now, the governor had found his backbone. On his orders, the garrison resumed fire, aiming directly for the delegation. By some miracle, none of them were injured, but the musket and cannon fire killed another three attackers. After this latest failure, the delegates sensed that they were now just as likely to be shot by the attackers as by the garrison, so they beat a hasty retreat. So far, the attack had gained the first few courtyards of the Bastille. However, the combination of kill zones, the superiority of the garrison's fire, and the lack of ammunition, prevented the assault from gaining any more ground. The attack had stalled, and it seemed as though the revolution would be dealt its first defeat. It was right around this time, when the mob's hope was failing, that a cannonball bounced ineffectually off of the Bastille's thick stone walls. Though late, the trained and professional soldiers, a combination of National Guard and defector army units, had joined the fray. The senior military officer fighting for the revolutionaries was Lieutenant Jacob Ely of the Queen's Regiment of Infantry. He, along with hundreds of other soldiers, had not come empty-handed. They brought with them cannon, and the expertise to use it. As those cannons roared from the streets, Eli made a cool appraisal of the attacker's predicament. Firstly, he determined that the main drawbridge had to be dropped. This meant taking the gatehouse, but that was only possible with supportive artillery fire. That artillery fire, however, was blocked by the smoke of the still burning hay carts. Ordering his troops to form a standing line in the street, Eli personally assisted in pushing the carts into the water. The few soldiers who dared to poke their heads above the battlements would have been astounded to see white and blue cloaked soldiers firing upon them in disciplined, focused volleys. The suppressive effect was immediate. After the fighting was over, the defenders, veterans of many sieges, recounted no such fire more accurate or constant than that delivered by the defector soldiers. Even now, as casualties mounted, Ely determined that the attack ought to be pressed home. Two cannons were repositioned to take advantage of the removal of the smokescreen. The eight-pounders fired into the exposed underbelly of the drawbridge, as attackers made a renewed assault upon the gatehouse. The sky had begun to darken by around five o'clock, as the rain that had threatened all day began to fall in a drizzle. It was also around this time that Lornay, suspecting that the situation was hopeless now that cannon had been employed against his garrison, offered to surrender. He had his men wave flags above the parapets and drummers sound the retreat, but to no avail. After some time of this, he wrote a brief note in which he threatened to detonate all 20,000 pounds of powder in the Bastille if he and his men were not allowed to surrender peacefully. Was this a bluff or a genuine threat? Time would soon tell. The note was slipped out of a hole in the wall near the moat. Where before the barrel of a musket had been poking out, now a hand and note appeared. This caught the mob's attention. Even with the fire continuing, a few people did try and reach the note. They extended a long gangplank across the moat, keeping it weighed down from the opposite end. The first guy to reach for the note fell and he broke his arm, but the second guy nabbed it successfully and rushed it back into the hands of the mob. The note was read aloud by many of the de facto leaders who had emerged during the day's fighting. When word of the note's message spread, the mob was indignant. There was to be no capitulation for the Bastille. Inside the fortress, Lornay waited on a response. He was waiting for a while. Even his officers, by now, were looking to surrender. And that's not to mention the bedraggled garrison troops. Tired, wounded, hungry, black and burned from the constant musket fire. They were all left waiting. As they waited, cannons continued to rip away the drawbridge, each shot weakening the bridge until it would fall and allow the final assault to be made.
it was now abundantly clear to Lornay that his bluff had been called. Instead of detonating the powder, he threw open the gates to the attackers, surrendering himself, the powder, the garrison, and the fortress. The storming of the Bastille was over. The violence, however, was not over. After seizing the Bastille, the mob looted the fortress, making off with official documents, weapons, and whatever silverware the governor dined with. The seven or so prisoners inside were released by the crowds, which by now had descended into the belly of the Bastille, hoping to find instruments of torture, body pits, or even hidden dungeons. They were to be disappointed to find no evidence of abuse. As the garrison prisoners were marshalled in the courtyard and taken in groups to the Hôtel de Ville, calls for summary execution were made by rabid agitators. Lornay was the principal target of these demands. The crowd rippled with fury at the mere sight of the man, jabbing him and other prisoners with muskets and bayonets. But Elie and other leaders determined that Lonay was needed alive. Elie led the prisoners personally. The note of capitulation brandished proudly on the tip of the captured governor's sword. Somewhere along the route from the Bastille to the Hotel, the mob's mass became too much for the few guardsmen who protected the prisoners. At various points, prisoners were picked off and murdered. Their mutilated corpses hung from street lamps, or la lanterne. Six were lynched in this manner. But the most violent excess was reserved for Lornay. Having heard that he was likely to be tried as a traitor by the permanent committee, the governor shouted something along the lines of, Enough, let me die. At which point he was seized by several of the mob. After defending himself a little too vigorously, with a solid kick to the plums of one of his assailants, an overzealous revolutionary ran him through with a bayonet. In an instant, the governor was variously shot, stabbed, bludgeoned, and beaten. The brutality didn't end there, as his corpse was repeatedly beaten and battered as it lay bleeding on the cobblestones. Valuables were stripped away by scavengers looking to take souvenirs. His cockade, lapels, tricorn, buttons, markings, and even his hair. A sword was then used to decapitate the body, but it proved too blunt, and so a pocket knife was used instead. The cheering crowd then took his body and paraded it through the streets, proclaiming victory over tyranny as they made their way to the Hôtel de Ville. The politician who before had placated the crowd and made assurances that there was no more gunpowder or ammunition in the hotel, well, he was spotted and singled out. In the ensuing frenzy, he was not only killed, but decapitated too. The heads were stuck on pikes, and marched all throughout Paris. Celebrations continued long into the night, as fireworks and cannonades boomed above ecstatic crowds. Uproarious flash demonstrations broke out in solidarity with the Vainqueurs de la Bastille, the conquerors of the Bastille. The celebrations only ended when the rain advanced from a mere drizzle to a full downpour. Versailles had observed the day's events with dismay. Upon returning from one of his many poorly timed hunting trips, King Louis was informed of the situation. When the full extent became apparent, he is, likely apocryphally, reported to have asked, is this a rebellion? To which his personal assistant replied, No, sire, it is a revolution. It was evident to all those who remained in the capital that the fall of the Bastille represented so much more than a mere punctuation mark to the violence and upheaval of the previous months. Seemingly out of nowhere, the mob had mobilized, organized, armed itself, and then successfully attacked a military fortification. All the while, royal troops either mutinied or refused to engage. What's more, the royal ministry proved completely impotent. It was the National Assembly and the Permanent Committee who called the shots. Louis had lost control of his kingdom. Frank discussions followed the king's realisation. Without the loyalty of the army, support from among the estates, or the approval of the people, there could be no effective royal government. Thus, the determination was made to assent to the National Assembly, to address them as equals, and to find the solutions so imminently required to divert France from its course towards societal and economic collapse. 
in essence, to demote the king and divest him of his God-given authority. Bourbon absolutism had been dealt a mortal wound. The day after the fall of the Bastille, an envoy was sent to Paris by Louis to convey his desire for talks with the National Assembly. Talks, mind you, not terms of surrender. The king and his royal ministry were still firmly of the opinion that they were the legitimate and rightful government of France, and that it was an indignity to suffer the insult of negotiations with a shadow government. Nevertheless, they were forced to swallow their pride and agree to a compromise. The thought was that the National Assembly could rein in the crowds and nip social revolution in the bud. The Assembly was mostly on board with this. Remember, their revolution was political, not social. Most delegates were advocates of the order and stability espoused by the royal government, differing principally on what source France's government should draw its authority, from absolutist license or a popular constitution. But of course, the Assembly represented a very disparate mix of ideologies, philosophies, and concepts. The revolutionary spirit of the nearly 600 delegates varied greatly. And while many were supportive of the actions at the Bastille, others were gravely concerned. True revolutionaries were now out in full force, exacerbating the rivalry between conservatives and liberals. So emerged a new wave of populist radical revolutionaries who wanted to take the revolution further, and in the process, action many of the more potent ideas of the Enlightenment. They saw the budding revolution as their vehicle for a comprehensive and total restructuring of French society. Unlike the liberals, theirs was a social revolution. But for now, both radicals and liberals were aligned, united by their shared vision for a constitution. In the National Assembly, radicals and liberals met news of the king's submission with differing opinions. Liberals were the claim radicals with suspicion. Speaking for all, however, Mirabeau reminded the delegates that the king had not yet given any ground, and his intention remained to belittle and subvert the assembly. But the fact remained that Louis was to meet with the National Assembly, on their terms, on their turf. Still, the king continued with the impenetrable imperiousness demanded of a monarch by royal etiquette. Having made his way to meet the National Assembly, Louis made a significant concession. He ordered the troops out of Paris and Versailles. This concession was, however, largely symbolic. Louis couldn't count on the troops to actually do anything anyway, and without the army in the city, the riled up crowds might settle down a bit. The king didn't give any ground on the reinstating of the care. Brutai would remain the controller general for the time being. Still, as far as the assembly was concerned, the day had gone very well. They had secured a small but important concession that at least indicated that the king was amenable to some demands. The naive notion that perhaps in time he could be convinced to accept a constitution began to look less outlandish. Many jubilant delegates escorted Louis and the royal entourage back to Versailles, where even Marie Antoinette made an appearance from atop the palace, receiving warm reception from the crowd and the delegates. Throughout Paris, the mobs had reassembled after the rains, and descended upon any of the city's available civic spaces. The atmosphere in the city was described as open and sincere by one observing, and it does seem as though there was an air of subdued excitement. Despite the bloody showing of the previous day, the crowds were now feeling, more than ever, that change might be on the horizon, as the King and the National Assembly were openly meeting, seemingly in good faith. At the Hôtel de Ville, the Marquis de Lafayette read aloud the king's address to the assembly and inferred that his majesty had been led astray by corrupt advisers. Once misguided, the king's course was now corrected. But for those of us paying attention, you will recall that we've seen this all happen before. Where negotiations start after some watershed event, the king convivially engages with the assembly until talks are bogged down and die, the cycle to repeat ad nauseum. And when the talks bog down, the propaganda arm of the National Assembly riles up the people, directing their ire towards the king and his allies. And so, with predictable certainty, the people could be relied upon to take to the streets in support of the Assembly. This time was different, however, in one important regard. The crowds were now largely united in aim, and had proven to be quite literally unstoppable when called to arms. 
I mean, good God, if the Bastille couldn't stop a pissed-off Paris, what could? So now, when word spread throughout the city that Nicaire was to remain in exile, at the king's command, the crowds responded by taking to the streets in their droves. And this time, the mob had to be taken very seriously. The general consensus seems to have been that the National Assembly didn't impress the king hard enough, especially on the matter of Nicaire's recall. It was now said that the king should be brought before the assembly and forced to concede to the demands of the people. The threat of more unrestrained mob violence loomed large in the minds of the king's advisers and ministers, many of whom were now convinced that the demands to reinstate Nicaire and to meet the National Assembly again were irresistible. Still, Louis persisted in his vain notion that the Swiss financier could yet be excluded from government, and so he consulted with the more bellicose members of his inner circle. They urged a foolhardy resistance to any demands. Louis then inquired as to the possibility of reconvening the Estates General in a more pliant city where loyal troops could be counted on to keep the peace. Soissons, perhaps? But the king quickly changed his tune when Broly informed him that the army could not be relied upon. Indeed, as we saw, the final assault on the Bastille was led by mutineer Guard Francais, and many of the army's units were openly sympathetic to the emerging revolution. There was nothing to prevent further betrayals. Clearly, the decision to leave Versailles was a difficult one for Louis. It was only with great reluctance that he mustered the courage to deliver himself into the hands of the assembly in Paris. Leaving behind his beloved family and his throne was gut-wrenching. Louis earnestly believed that he was walking into a trap, into the lion's den. Just prior, he had made a will and prayed for a while, before saying what he knew might well be his final farewell to both his wife and his children. To suffer such shame and humiliation as to meet on the National Assembly's terms, and on so ignoble a pretext as having to give more ground, well, it was certainly Louis's lowest point thus far. And that really is saying something. This was the price he paid for failure. So Louis, late on July 15th, flanked by his brothers, ascended the steps to the Hôtel de Ville. Devoid of any of the courtly splendour or royal etiquette so essential to the mystique of the royal persona, Louis was a defeathered peacock, compelled to kowtow for the first time in his life. The National Assembly presented a number of proposals, well, let's be honest, demands actually, for the King's consideration. We'll go over a few of them. Firstly, they requested to be granted emergency powers, essentially making the Assembly the principal civil and legal authority in Paris, and thereby in all of France. These powers also conferred upon the Assembly full legislative functions, a big step, because it now meant that they could make their own laws. Next, they got formal recognition for the National Guard. An agreement was also made to recall Nicaire from Switzerland and reinstate him as Director General of Finance. Most importantly, they were given permission to establish the Paris Commune. Now the Paris Commune, which will from here on out play an extremely important role in the course of the revolution, was to become the chief authority for metropolitan Paris. Unlike before, where Paris was governed by a council of mayors, with each mayor in charge of their own part of the city, now all of Paris would be united and governed by a single elected mayor. They would be in charge of all 48 communes of Paris. No longer could the capital, the beating heart of French politics, be effectively influenced by the monarchy. But the king's humiliation was not over just yet. Returning by coach on mid-morning of the 17th of July, Louis and his 30-man entourage were hailed with joyous shouts and cries of admiration as the procession crept up the Rue Saint-Honoré towards the packed Hôtel de Ville. But before entering the hotel, Louis was presented with a tricolour cockade, the symbol of the revolution. He was implored to wear it by impassioned onlookers. Reluctantly, the king affixed the cockade to his tricorn. Several delegates held swords in a high arch above the king's head as he walked in now stripped of his bodyguard and surrounded by applauding Parisian commoners. Inside, the National Assembly congratulated the king on his good sense. They lauded him for his choice to appear before them, restating their admiration for his majesty and their loyalty to the kingdom. 
Louis delivered a few inelegant responses to the many delegates before stepping out onto the balcony overlooking the masses gathered in the Place de Greve. At this point, the crowds exploded with abundant cries of Vive le Roy and Vive la Nation. The mood among the assembly was equally grateful. One member remarked to Louis, Sire, with the cockade and the third estate, you shall conquer Europe. At this stage, Louis ratified all of the National Assembly's laws and actions, thus reiterating its prerogatives. Later, after the king had returned to Versailles, President Bailly and Lafayette, yeah, probably should have mentioned that, but Bailly was elected president of the assembly in the meantime. Anyway, he and Lafayette conveyed the news of the tribe to the people of Paris. But here's the rub. All of this farce and public reconciliation was just that, farce. And the wily Parisians mostly saw through the ruse. So when in the coming days the National Assembly recommitted, with its newly granted powers, to drafting the constitution, and so encouraged Parisians to return to work, many chose to forego the six livre compensation and did not disperse. Instead, they did what they did best, riot. Violence and unrest resumed throughout all of France as well. The mayor of Troyes was murdered, a senior army officer lynched in Cannes, and in Rennes and Marseille there were mass army defections. The peasants of Paris, decentralized but highly motivated, were asserting their capacity to force social and economic change. Yeah, the National Assembly promised these changes, but was now viewed increasingly with suspicion verging on contempt for their perceived inactivity and inattentiveness. It's easy to understand why. After a promising few weeks, with all these demonstrations, assemblies, speeches and promises, material conditions were still deplorable. The price of bread continued to rise, wages were still stagnant, the nobles were still privileged, and jobs were coming fewer and further between. Simply put, the basic needs of the people were going unfulfilled. The National Assembly was largely using the legitimacy and power it had gained by being the sole representative institution in all of France to enact its own modernizing and democratic reforms. Necessary reforms, I will add, but entirely political reforms. These were changes that would benefit a bourgeois class more so than the commons. The aims of reform and social change subverted to the desires of a newly empowered political middle class. This fact was not lost on the people. The honeymoon period was now over, and a more practical relationship was to emerge with the mob. They would only heed the assembly conditionally. The revolution, at long last, was taking on a life of its own, separate from the National Assembly and from events in Paris alone. A revolution directed by the middle class, but propelled from below. And now begun, the momentum of popular revolution could not and would not be stopped.